Testing, testing, testing. All right. My name is Julie Busi. I am a registered nurse. I work at Mass General Hospital. I've been a nurse there for 34 years. I cover the emergency room, um, in-house, and um, outside help with outside hospital transfers. My name is Nicole Gately, and I have been a registered nurse for just under 11 years and started in the emergency department. My name is Elizabeth Regan. I am a pediatric critical care nurse at Boston Medical Center. So there's a huge issue. There are no mental health facilities available for a lot of people. The beds are so limited. Um, so a lot of them actually get stuck in the hospital on medicine floors and don't actually get the psychiatric help they need. Um, and so the emergency room is just flooded and like overwhelmed by um, mental health cases. Um, and it really adds a lot of stress to the emergency room and to taking care of patients. There is this growing problem with, with mental health in our country and the facilities that we have, as hard as they try, they really cannot keep up with the demand, especially in the emergency room. When During my time there, we did see a large influx and it's unfortunate that everyone does their best and tries to provide services, but um, dedicated facilities um, are really lacking in this country. There's always more that can be done. Um, I think it's difficult in terms of when someone comes in for a crisis in the emergency department, you have to first determine if it's medical versus um, more of a mental or mental health crisis. So once that's determined that it's ruled out to be an otherwise medical crisis, um, they would then be examined by the psychi psychiatric team, um, and then the process kind of goes from there. When they first come in, they get assessed the same as, as every other patient, um, depending on the mental health crisis that they're currently having. Oftentimes they do have uh, security personnel or other uh, professionals who do stay with them um, for their safety and their comfort. A lot of times they do require different blood work and testing and then really the services in my experience have been to involve um, social workers and other counselors and get them what therapy services that they need. Usually they just try to get you know their medical health history, try to figure out what's actually causing the crisis this time, um, get them back on their medications. They try to get psychiatric, um, the psychiatrists involved, and then find out if it's something they can safely go home or do they need like a, a psych admission to like a psych facility or um, just how they can help them get back on their feet. Um, and a lot of times they wait days and days for beds because there's no availability anywhere for these patients. They would first determine if it's medical versus mental health. And then once, if it is medical, they would address any medical issues that they would have and have different teams address different issues. Um, and then once it's determined to be a mental health crisis, um, what happens in the emergency department that I work in is that they would be, um, told kind of first of all what the situation was going to be like, that they would be brought to a different room which would be safer for them. Um, we would have any things that could be potentially harmful to themselves or other people removed from the room. I would say on a daily basis this happens multiple times a day. Um, again, the emergency department is for acute situations um, so there is always going to be you're going to be seeing people at their worst typically um, so the first line of you know defense or the first goal is to have any non-pharmacological interventions um, any 
redirection, de-escalation, if it's just like by environment, if we can provide any like redirection of any sorts, um, that's always the first line. Then we would potentially introduce um, medications if that was the case. Also, people do get physically restrained um, if they are a threat to themselves or to others. The nature of the emergency department truthfully can be volatile at, at, for many reasons at, at many times. So I have personally um, had patients who have um, come at me as well as my colleagues in the past. And unfortunately, the, we do try and avoid you know, contact and just talk to them and see if there's a way that we can reach a mutual respect or understanding. Um, that does not always work, so that does end up with, you know, medication and isolation and other therapies for their protection, as well as the protection of the other patients and staff. That happens all the time, especially in the emergency room. And at Mass General, we rely on security most of the time to help with these patients because we don't want to get the staff hurt. Um, so a lot of times we have a really well-trained security staff that will come in and intervene and help take care of the patient, help restrain them, help you know get them out of harm's way, get the staff out of harm's way, and then the doctors and the nurses will come in and help with the medication to kind of try to settle them down. Yes, because the, a lot of times the overwhelming amount of patients in the emergency room just is just too many too much for a lot of people to handle so nurses sometimes differ with the physicians because the physicians the nurses are the ones taking care of the patients pretty much full on and they can get frustrated um, that the physicians aren't doing what they think they need to do to help these patients either get discharged or get placed um, and everybody's trying to do the same thing and the right thing for the patients but it can cause a lot of you know disagreements yeah i think taking care of people is personal and you want to check yourself when you go to work and check your biases at the door obviously but there everyone has a different way of thinking which is can be incredibly beneficial um, so I think there's always times where I, I would say every day where I would disagree or maybe not disagree but I don't that wouldn't be my first thought or you know maybe I wouldn't have done that first kind of thing but you always want to discuss that before addressing the patient because you want to put on and you want to make sure that everyone is on the same page and know that you're in united front and that you're not coming at the patient and that you're trying to work with them and that everyone's on the same page. I think truthfully the nature of the ED is very collaborative. We have primary physicians but we also had PAs and nurses and um, in other specialties involved and that will lead to a difference of opinions and different approaches because everyone's coming at it from a different angle. The, the primary thing, and I guess the most important thing, is that we, everyone works together um, to listen to others' opinions and also listen to the patients and really expressing what their needs are. That depends obviously you would think of like physical injuries um, if there was ever like a motor vehicle accident um, if there's any self-inflicted injuries gunshot wounds um, right now in this climate unfortunately children are seen so frequently with gunshot injuries that come into the er um, anyone that's in like cardiogenic potential shock or respiratory failure, anything like that would obviously be number one. So at Mass General, we're a level one trauma center. So we get a lot of the traumas and the emergencies. And a lot of times you don't know what's coming through the door. So it just kind of gets dumped on the emergency room and they have to just jump in and work on a patient and do things without having very little information um, and just rely on their skills and their clinical expertise and you know try to help the patient the best they can. And it can be very chaotic probably the traumatic arrest. So that would be ones that result in, for example, a car accident that had significant injuries for the family. Um, sorry, for the patient, I should say. And oftentimes, some of those require emer emergent surgery. Other times, they require procedures at the bedside. And you have to work 
extremely quickly. And there can also be multiple things going on when someone's been in such a bad accident. It's not typically just one body system that you're addressing. You're trying to address multiple things at the same time. The short answer is yes, um, absolutely. That is the most difficult conversation that you will ever have to have as a healthcare provider. Um, unfortunately, when you work in the ER, those conversations um, can be quite frequent and um, really part of the job, but they never get easier. Um, and it's definitely difficult. Luckily, as a nurse, don't have to take on that role because um, I'm not the provider. But I mean, yeah, that's like probably the worst thing you could ever say to somebody. So I think it, if you're saying it, you know, maybe daily or every week, that totally takes a huge toll on you. Yes, I think they do that all the time because we have things after emergencies when people pass away or things happen called debriefings. And we debrief with the nurses and the doctors and we talk about what happened, what could we have done differently, whether we could have saved them, the reasons that it happened the way it happened. So they actually get to talk it out. So everybody gets to give their opinion and kind of talk about how things went. And it's a good way to kind of talk it over, especially if somebody doesn't make it and they pass away, um, because it kind of makes them feel a little better um, that they did everything they could possibly do and that the outcome was still the same. When you get into medicine, especially emergency medicine, and you know you're going to be in those situations, um, you do it because obviously you want to help people save lives. So every time that that's not possible, um, it is, it's incredibly difficult and you always wish you had more time. You always wish that there was something else that you could do. And having those, those thoughts, I feel are, are very natural and, and probably common, but the reality is, is that doctors, nurses, everyone in that room, you know, they do everything they can. And, and certainly if we had more time or, or the situation was different, we would hope to save everyone. Um, but the reality is, is sometimes that's, that's just not, not possible. I don't, they have a very tight circle, um, the physicians. So they really, I think they talk amongst themselves a lot. And I know there's a lot of extra help um, offered to them to talk about things, but they're actually, the groups that I work with, most of them are pretty stoic and they're pretty, you know what I mean? confident and um, I'm sure they have their weak moments and you know they'll talk to us about things but I think a lot of times it's just a tough job. No I think that we are we're all human and working in high stress environments. Um, I'm sure that there are you know physicians out there who have mental health um, concerns and things that they struggle with and coping skills stress management um, for sure you know we we're human, we have emotions, we, we do the best we can, but um, they're very stressful environments. So I'm sure there are things that come up. Finding support can come in, in many different um, aspects and from many different places. Um, I would hope that the doctors have support from their teams as I always felt like I did when I was in the ER. As a nurse, don't think anybody in the mental health, in the hospital or in the health field has enough supports for any kind of mental health crises. Everybody has their own life going on versus how they work. So life can be stressful at home and life can be extremely stressful at work. Of course. You're welcome. All right. Thank you for the time. Thank you for um, letting me talk.